Uh, it's a real pleasure, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, when Mara invited me to make this presentation, you know, I don't know if you know how this works, but basically uh, it was like a, a blank slate. I think I could have chosen any topic. And so I thought about it. I mean, what a wonderful opportunity to, to be able to think through some topic, hopefully at a level that might be useful to, uh, to other researchers. And so I thought about a number of things that, you know, that we might talk about, like I'm, I'm, I'm just delighted by and fascinated by research and advances that people, um, including people in this room, have made about uh, finance and culture. I think there's a lot more to be done there. I think that we as a profession are still neophytes and learning about uh, what culture is. You know, even the concept of social capital, I think, is something that uh, is befuddling to us and how you measure th these things and how you tie them to the kind of economic outcomes that, that we think um, uh, are connected in, in very important ways. I also thought about, uh, you know, I've done work, as Mara mentioned, on financial and other types of business misconduct. I think that's really uh, interesting and important. Uh, it goes to what I think is the fundamental aspect of business, and that is the relationships that uh, firms and individuals have with their suppliers, their customers, their communities, their stakeholder community at large. You know, I think that uh, continues to be a, a driving force in our field, sort of formation and management of trust and relationships, which is the basis for um, basically all economic exchange and production activity. Uh, but I settled on this topic, corporate takeover defenses, in, and, and compared to some other topics, it feels more like an um, old-style topic. It's a meat and potatoes kind of thing. We're going to be talking about takeovers. Uh, theory of the firm, st some th stuff that in some ways takes you back quite a while, quite a ways, I should say. You know, the theory of the firm, uh, you know, we, th we think as going back to Adam Smith's uh, discussion of the pin factory and the division of labor, Alfred Marshall's characterization of price theory, we call that the theory of the firm, although it's really about uh, the role of prices in allocating resources. Uh, and then Ronald Coase writing in 1937 and beginning to open up the doors of what's going on inside the organization. And that's what I think takeover defenses allow us to get a unique insight on is sort of the inner operations of the firm in ways that I'd like to talk about. So um, the first thing I'd like to mention is that takeover defenses are everywhere. Nearly all firms, all large firms, have at least one of the E-index provisions. Um, 92% of IPO firms do as, as well. For fun, I went on Google, uh, Google Scholar, and just searched for hits uh, as a way of calibrating. You can see you know, there's a lot of hits for takeover defenses or anti-takeover provisions, and, and the number of such hits are you know, sort of in the same order of magnitude as CAPM model or fama Finch three-factor model, or, and bigger than for simply takeover bids. So it's, you know, the, it's a, uh, a phenomenon that attracts a lot of research interest. Why? Well, I think there are two main reasons. First, takeover defenses are really easy to measure. You can see whether a firm has a classified board or not pretty easily. And there are, take, and there are uh, databases that make it even easier for us. Although, as I will mention toward the end of this talk, those databases themselves are going to be the source of some concern. Number two, though, is I think the most driving reason why takeover defenses attract a lot of research attention. And that is they allow insight into fundamental aspects of firm organization. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So if we were to sort of step back, um, say, roll back the tape of time to the early 1800s, and let's say someone walked up to you, you're a person of that era, and they said, you know, for the next 200 years, economic, the uh, main driver of economic activity and the production of wealth and social well-being around the world for the next 200 years is going to be an organization in which some people fork their money over to other people to manage. You'd probably go, nah, that's not going to work. And yet that's exactly what happened. How is it that the seeming Rube Goldberg machine of the corporate form of organization, how did it have survival value? Well, a lot of people have opined on this, and, and we know that there are a number of things that are very important in this. Uh, one very important thing is the threat of outside takeover and the ability of shareholders, 
the investors in the firm and the equity of the firm to leave their ownership stake without having to dissolve the organization as you have to do, say, with a partnership. Um, take our defenses, therefore, help us to understand the nature of the takeover market and its threat, which is central to managing that agency conflict that is core to this particular form of organization, which, again, arose, I'll have some discussion about this, arose because of the opportunity to, to exploit uh, cooperative, large-scale enterprise and the economies that come with that. My bottom bullet point here points to, I think, a new development in our understanding of the takeover defense literature, and that is that defenses also help gain insight into the nature of business relationships and how they are built and managed and maintained. I've organized this talk around five questions. So here are the questions. I won't go through, I won't cite them right now, but I also have two propositions at the end of this. And my first proposition is I'm gonna propose that there are four papers. I think one of them is in print and the other are working papers that I think is gonna change research in this area. And the, second, and the other thing is I'm gonna leave with some questions, six questions, that I think will animate much future research in the area. Oh, maybe one more setup slide. I'm drawing from a lot of stuff um, that I think, so these are papers in which I've been involved from which I'm drawing, and I have a couple of things I wanted to point out. So I first got into this whole part of the field uh, through an experience that I heard Laura relate just recently. I think it was just yesterday. So Laura Field was on the, who's here, is, uh, was, on the, uh, was on the job market. And uh, she came to visit us in Seattle. And in my memory, we were like taking a ferry ride. I was trying to impress Laura with, you know, the Pacific Northwest stuff. Taking a ride on a ferry to go get a cup of coffee and then ride back or something like that. And somewhere during this conversation, you know, I oh, with displaying, you know, typical overconfidence, I say something like, oh, you know, um, IPO firms would never have takeover defenses. And my thinking embodied the thinking of the day through about the year 2000 or so, which was the thinking that takeover defenses are primarily entrenching devices. And there's a great quote by uh, Easterbrook and, and Fischel, two legal scholars, saying something like, you know, IPO firms would never have takeover defenses because they would destroy value. And, you, you know, the, the pre-IPO shareholders would not want to internalize that value loss. It's only, it's only later that firms acquire takeover defenses. A fact which explains a lot or something like that. I'm paraphrasing what they say. So anyways, I say some version of that. And Laura turns to me and she goes, you know, IPO firms have takeover defenses. You know, just sort of blew my, blew my world uh, apart to have to take that into account and eventually over time try to make sense of it, out of it. I like that story for another reason too, in that it illustrates how research ideas uh, start and how they can even manifest into, into uh, papers that are very rewarding and where you discover new things. There's another paper on this list, actually a couple of papers on this list, uh, where I worked with Bill Johnson and Sang Ho Yi. And I want to mention those papers because they literally got their start at the FMA meetings. So, you know, go to a session, uh, mill around the, the, you know, the, the coffee, and like for two years in a row, two FMA meetings in a row, Bill would sort of say, hey, you know, this takeover stuff, I think it's sort of interesting. And I say, what do you mean? And he'd tell me he's looking at some takeover defenses and their impacts. And basically, it led to a couple of papers. So this really is how papers get started, uh, through talking about ideas, including at places like this conference, and maybe even this session. The last paper I want to point out to you on this list is at the bottom. A lot of what I'm going to have to say, but not everything, draws from a, a, a review article that uh, uh, Michael Wittry and I have been working on for a handbook on corporate governance that Dave Dennis is editing. Okay, with that, question number one, what is a takeover defense? Well, here's one definition that I've seen. It's basically any action that increases the cost 
of, of a takeover bid. I think that's too broad a definition because many things that managers do, including the things that we try to teach our MBA students to get better at, involve like finding and developing and nurturing positive NPV projects. Well, a positive NPV project increases the cost to an outside bidder of an acquisition. So, so this is too broad a, of a definition. And what I'm gonna suggest instead that we go with something a little more tractable, and that is a takeover defense is any of a set of charter or bylaw provisions or specific corporate board actions or coverage by state anti-takeover laws that increase the cost, the, uh, the net expected cost of an acquisition to an outside bidder. Now, this itself it has some, some ambiguity around it, like, you know, particularly, you know, what are board actions that would be classified as takeover defenses? Well, we include poison pills in those actions, and we might include a number of other things, standstill agreements, uh, even, you know, the sale of an asset to, uh, to forestall an acquisition. Uh, but there's, there's some ambiguity, but I'm gonna go forward with this definition. Um, it's important to point out that first, there's a US centric aspect to this whole part of the literature, uh, but it's uh, not only US firms that deal with these issues. Most of our data are uh, unique to the legal environment in uh, the United States in which things like poison pills are allowed, whereas in a number of other countries, things that look like poison pills are not. There's a lot of small numbers here. I don't expect you to see them. I just wanted to give a nod to one, one framework, one definition of takeover defenses that uh, is operational is simply uh, any one of the 24 provisions that Gomper's Ishii metric identified in their 2003 paper, which I list here. And then these numbers just represent uh, count or percentages of these 24 provisions over time among basically S&P 500 firms or 1,500 firms. As an aside, it's worth pointing out that a number of papers treat takeover defenses as measures of governance quality. Uh, you see this also a lot in the management literature. And I think that we're, we're gonna have to discard that notion. Uh, if one obvious reason for this is that a lot of the evidence that I'll be uh, talking about indicates that takeover defenses are associated frequently with increases in value and value increasing actions by top managers. It would be sort of perverse to think of having takeover defenses that are associated with value increasing actions as being indicators of poor governance quality. So instead, I think it's useful to think of takeover defenses as simply provisions, actions, state laws that increase the cost of outside acquisition. Question two. How come they're so widespread? Well, for this, I'd like to go back a little bit in time. In fact, I'm gonna go back 2,000 years in time. So how many people have seen this type of chart? What I have here is uh, wordy, worldwide GDP per capita measured over time over the last 2,000 years. Can I ask for a show of hands if you've seen this chart before? Okay, thank you, a couple people, but not very many. Uh, to my knowledge, this chart, this, this particular set of dots was constructed by my co-author, Mike Whitry, uh, using publicly available information. But uh, the first version of this, of which I'm aware, was published around 20 years ago, 22 years ago, by a British historian named Angus Madison. If you get on the, get on, on the web and look up Angus Madison, it turns out that there's a very active research institute uh, in his name. Uh, that tracks uh, data of which this is only one of the outcomes. Uh, Jonathan Haidt, the social psychologist from Columbia, has called this the most important graph in the world. And I think it is a very important graph because it leads to a lot of questions and insight about things that we care about, economic development being only one. But what I want to point to and use this graph for the following reasons. You know, first, uh, you know, there's this you know, amazing flatness in average uh, GDP uh, per capita uh, for, you know, basically nearly 1,800 years. And then around 1820, it ticks up and then it goes into the stratosphere in this hockey stick, hockey stick type fashion. And most people, when asked about this, immediately say, well, it was the Industrial Revolution. You say, okay, 
three. But I want to point to this through the lens of the corporate form of organization. Um, before the uh, 19th century, there were, in fact, corporate charters. Uh, in the, you know, I'm most familiar with British and US common law. And you know, we normally think of the first corporation as being maybe the South Seas uh, uh, Company in 1600. Uh, but it turns out that there are a lot of corporate charters for primarily community type organizations such as cemeteries or churches up until about 1800. That was the most common form of corporate organization. And, and you can see why this would have developed, that you wanted an entity with which people could uh, conduct business that would have some attractive characteristics that you don't have if they were organized as, say, proprietorships. For example, you know, uh, you didn't want the, you know, the people who are managing or owning or having the residual claim to, uh, say, a cemetery, you didn't want that organization to sort of have to dissolve and reform in some 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 sense when you know when the, those people themselves die and go to the cemetery. So there's there's this ongoing uh, nature of certain types of productive activity that that was that previously were organized in the corporate form, and and then what happened in the early 1800s with the uh, discoveries that we associate with the industrial Re revolution is that you had people like Cornelius Vanderbilt saying, hey, there's this large scale type of enterprise, railroads, for example, large steamboat transportation that produce tremendous surpluses. You know, and these guys are motivated because they wanted to capture as much of that surplus as they could. Tremendous surpluses if we can scale up production, but the scale that we're talking about is just too big to be financed by any individual and with too much risk that any small group of individuals would be willing to, to bear. So let's use this corporate form of organization. Let's get a corporate charter for this thing. And they started to develop and, and sort of uh, hone uh, uh, corporate charters for private enterprise to the form that we know now in hand in hand with the development of a number of common law uh, innovations. And almost immediately when that started happening, we saw corporate takeover battles and corporate takeover defenses. Let me give you some examples. Um, I characterize the corporate takeover defenses that we see as the result of this offensive and defensive push and pull in the takeover, takeover market. One early wave of takeovers was in the uh, mid to late 1980s where you had on the offense people like Jay Gould and Jim Fiske. So I, I pulled pictures from the era. This is a cartoon of supposed to be Jay Gould weaving his web of deceit and control over corporations that he sought to gain control of. And immediately you saw, the def you saw people coming up with defensive tactics. So like when these guys showed up to launch a proxy fight, they sometimes would show up to an empty hall because the defensive move was simply to move the meeting location without telling the corporate raiders. And naturally, we also saw political reactions associated with this wave of offense and defensive innovation, the, not limited to regulation. The Interstate Commerce Commission was uh, in, motivated in large part through this heated, uh, very juicy, you know, worthy of movies battles for control of, of, of railroads. Um, even the antitrust laws with which we're familiar have their roots in part through this offensive and defensive set of innovations in the corporate takeover market. Or how about another wave of takeovers in the 1920s, which George Stiegler characterized as a wave of oligopoly takeovers. Well, what we saw was the development of uh, and the use of tender offers, proxy fights by former execs seeking to gain control of, a, of an organization that they previously had, had run. Stock manipulation schemes, which now we recognize as illegal because of the Securities Acts. Um, and, and we also saw as a defensive tactic, the rise of the use of dual class shares. And again, part of the political reaction was the Securities Acts, as well as uh, increased uh, additions to our antitrust law canon. Or how about in the 50s and 60s, another wave of takeovers. Their uh, major uh, innovative uh, uh, 
uh, offensive tactic was the development of what was called the Saturday Night Special, which has an unfortunate connotation with guns, but here the, the term was used to talk about short-term tender offers. So you'd make a tender offer for, say, a 10% premium on Friday that would close, say, by Monday, creating a rush to tender problem for shareholders who would have incentive to tender their shares to avoid being frozen out on the back end of a two-tiered acquisition. So if they didn't get their 10% premium now, they might get nothing later on. So they're rushed to tender. Um, well, in response, we saw the development and widespread use of the things that we now recognize as takeover defenses, classified board, supermajority vote provisions. And we also saw political re reaction through the Williams Act, 1968, a federal law that uh, mandated, among other things, that tender offer windows be of minimum length. For example, now 20 days. Um, also, this is when we saw the rise of first generation state takeover laws. How about the 1980s? Same thing, you can keep rolling this forward. You know, so here's T. Boone Pickens, junk bond financing, a major innovative uh, response was a, a, a court challenge to the first generation state takeover laws that eventually won, striking down these 38 pre-existing laws in different states. Um, and immediately, we saw two things happen. Poison pills were invented in response to this offensive innovation, and second generation state laws began to be adopted. The first one in Ohio in 1982, again, right after the Edgar versus Might decision. Um, this is a chart, again, a lot of small print, but uh, I use it just to point out that uh, it's a timeline that goes back 40 years that, that has a little more detail compared to my schematics on the previous couple of slides. But to raise the question, where are we now in this cycle? Well, this is sort of conjectural, but uh, we now have a, a, a sort of a, a nice stable of offensive tactics that were honed uh, through uh, innovation and practice over the last 20 years that include institutional and hedge fund activism and what I, you can characterize as proxy advisory service activism, such as ISS is an you know, active um, uh, stepping into the, uh, into the debate on whether certain anti-takeover provisions are good or bad for firms. What are the defenses? Well, we have anti-activist poison pills, a tweak to the old style poison pill. We have statements of broader corporate purpose and ESG, which have a number of other motivations and outcomes, but also have the potential to act as takeover deterrents. We also see a certain amount of political reactions that overlap in this area too, including uh, the rise of constituency statutes um, in, um, in many different states. Where does that leave us now? Well, I think there are a couple of things that we could infer that describe the current landscape of the takeover and, de and takeover defense market. And the first is that, as stated previously, everybody's got one of these things, at least one of these things. So this is, uh, e these are E-index provisions. Again, a lot of small numbers. I just wanted to point out that uh, it's now easy to get this kind of information. This tracks, this uses the old uh, ISS legacy or IRC data up through 2006, and then the newer ISS governance data starting in 2007 for the six different provisions. And just to point out that these data are easily and readily available. A second thing that we can say about the current takeover and takeover defense landscape is that takeover defenses are not fixed but they're almost fixed. They're extremely sticky. We see some takeover dynamic, takeover defense dynamics, uh, some removals, some additions, but this is a chart of, for the first, first 15 years after a firm's IPO, uh, just a histogram of the number of firm years in which there is no change in a firm's takeover defense versus instances in which, in which there are additions or subtractions. Basically, you see removals in only 1.3% of all firm years. So, so takeover defenses are not fixed, but they're extremely sticky. And in fact, the most reliable prediction of a firm's takeover defenses, say after the firm is 10 or 15 years old, 
is the set of takeover defenses it had when it went public. The very thing that Laura shed the light on, turned the light on for me, I should say, many years ago. Um, a third thing uh, that I think we can say about the current takeover and takeover defense market is that the legal environment is relatively stable compared to previous eras. It's now been well established that poison pills in the United States are legal. There are certain aspects of pills that uh, have, been, have been sort of whittled out and, and, and um, have not survived. But by and large, what we see uh, in terms of uh, poison pills has been settled. And likewise, there were a, a couple of very important uh, Supreme and appellate court decisions in the late 1980s that pretty much established the boundaries that state legislators le could, uh, in which they could act to uh, establish laws protecting the uh, firms that are, that are headquartered in their states. All firms, I think everybody agrees, now have shadow poison pills and, and hedge fund shareholder acquisition are just standard in the, in the, in the kits that entrepreneurial monitors, takeover uh, activists uh, have at hand. And then the last thing I think that I'd like to say about just describing the current landscape is that through all of this set uh, and waves of innovation on both the offensive and defensive side, we, over the last couple of decades, we've observed a very robust, if cyclical, takeover market. So takeover defenses, while they can make it more costly or impede some takeovers, have not seemed to be prohibitive in the acquisition market. Okay, question number three. Now this is a question that has motivated much of the research in this literature, and that is, are defenses used primarily for shareholders or managers' interest? So in one corner, we have the entrenchment hypothesis, which, with which I'm sure many of us have worked with in one form or the other, which holds that takeover defenses primarily serve managers' interest at the expense of shareholders by insulating them from the threat of ouster through the external takeover market, leading to the consumption of more private benefits. And there's a lot of support for this. This is just a partial list of papers that, uh, in which the authors, authors infer support for the entrenchment hypothesis. And of course, there are many more. Many investors hold uh, an entrenchment view. So you see this, say, at institutional shareholder services. There was this uh, shareholder rights project that the Harvard Law School uh, sponsored, which targeted a, a fair number of large firms to get them to rescind their uh, classified board status and go to uh, annual voting on all, all board members. You see this among institutional investors as well. This is a quote from Dimensional Fund Advisors, which basically says, uh, we're going to vote our shares against pills. And they also say other anti-takeover defenses. Um, and, uh, and also, we're going to vote against directors that put pills in place. So this is now, I think, standard thinking about takeover defenses. However, the standard thinking, which I think I very much was in the camp of a long time ago, has received this almost, you know, for a while, sort of this um, irritating, annoying uh, alternate voice, uh, which has become louder and now somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, dominant in the literature in just uh, recent years. And that is that, no, there are some channels by which takeover defenses serve shareholders' interest. So there are three channels primarily, and I list them here, by which a shareholder's uh, interest a, a view of takeover defenses can work. The first one is that uh, takeover defense concentrates in the manager's hands the authority and ability to work with a potential bidder to negotiate a higher takeover premium than might otherwise happen because share, shareholders have this collective action problem that I described earlier, being, you know, having incentive to rush to tender. So that's one version of the, of the stakeholders' interest, sorry, the shareholders' interest hypothesis. And I think a really clear initial statement of that was in this D'Angelo and Rice paper in 1983. 
We also have this uh, uh, channel by which TKO defenses protect uh, positive net present value courses of action or projects against market myopia in which outside investors, including takeover bidders, don't have the information that inside managers have about these positive NPV projects. And so they forestall what would turn out to be ex post, to be mistakes in the takeover market. And this, is, this idea, I think, is nicely articulated in Jeremy Stein's theory paper. The channel that I'll tend to lean on the most for the rest of these comments is this last one, the bonding channel. And what do I mean by bonding? Well, rather than reading through this, I have a couple of slides by the, uh, uh, that, that try to go into this. So this is also the reason why I proposed earlier that takeover defenses help us to better understand the nature by which business relationships are formed and maintained. By their very nature, business relationships frequently require one or the other counterparty to the relationship to make relationship-specific investments. So, um, you know, uh, the classic example of this, the prototypical example of this is Fisher Body locating its plants close to General Motors in the 1920s because it was a provider to General Motors of the hard shell uh, uh, outer part of a car. And according to Lore, Fisher Body having made these fixed investments uh, in where they located their plants were then subject to a holdup problem from General Motors who could say, well, okay, you know, we negotiated a contract for these things uh, at, a, at a price that reflected your average total cost, but now that some of those costs are fixed and sunk, we can negotiate down to your average variable cost, and you'll still be willing to sell to us. So that's the holdup problem. Now, it turns out that whether or not this anecdote, which is widely cited, is historically accurate is, is open to question. So Ronald, no less than Ronald Coase himself wrote a whole paper. And this is a guy who you know, won a Nobel Prize writing like two papers and deserved the Nobel Prize for either paper. Um, so he took the time to write yet another paper basically saying, you know, I was basically saying, I'm old, I was there. The story that everyone tells about Fisher Body, it's not really how it happened. Nonetheless, the story helps illustrate the, po the possibility for opportunistic behavior when business relationships are formed. And so what constrains that opportunism? Well, there's a long, long literature in the industrial organization space that addresses and, and wrestles with this. And one, uh, one possible answer is that you have vertical integration that manages, you know, essentially General Motors did acquire Fisher Body, thereby eliminating this incentive to hold up your counterparty and, and decreasing the incentive for your counterparty to ever get into a contract with you in the first place. Um, there are reputational losses that can manage this. You know, if you, if you uh, renege on a, on, a, on, a, on a deal and say, I'm, you know, I'm going a different uh, direction or I only deal with you at lower prices, uh, you know, you, or you harm your reputation. That hurts you in the future. You can also rely on manager's commitment. So Schleifer and Summers have a really nice uh, uh, article that, that articulates this idea, in which they, they point out that managers can be selected for their ability and willingness to commit to the implicit and ex explicit contracts by which our counterparties are at risk of opportunism on our part. And so what protects the managers who have made that kind of credible personal commitment? Well, takeover defenses. So takeover defenses, by helping insulate the managers from being tossed out, make it harder for an outside bidder to extract these appropriable quasi-rents that arise from business relationships. So that's what I mean by bonding. I do have an example. Uh, from my neck of the woods, there's a, there's a, a, a relatively small uh, manufacturer and fabricator of specialty parts for airplanes, especially in airplane wings, called LMI. They have contracts with Boeing. Boeing and LMI are both 
at high risk of holdup problems from the other side because they both need relationship-specific investments. Boeing, for example, has tailored a lot of its manufacturing process to the type of inputs that it's getting from LMI. And uh, it's shared a lot of trade secrets with LMI's engineers so that they can fabricate their parts more efficiently and get the right kinds of solutions to their manufacturing problems. Well, it's no coincidence, I submit, that when LMI went public, it did have takeover defenses in part, or in place, in part to help bond its relationship with its, uh, with its counterparties, such as Boeing, to try to guarantee that it would not in the future act opportunistically through an outside bidder seeking to acquire those, those, those rents that are at stake. Well, there's a lot of support for the shareholder's interest hypothesis too. And um, you know, again, I, this is not an exhaustive list, but here's a list of papers where the authors infer support for one or more of the channels by which shareholders' interests can be served by, by uh, takeover defenses. So the fact that we have this you know, lineup of, of results on both sides of this debate is what I call the takeover defense puzzle. The puzzle is that despite years of research and dozens, I think we're up into three figures of, <clears throat> of, of papers trying to examine this question, there's still no consensus on whether it's entrenchment or shareholders' interests that primarily characterize defenses and the reasons for defenses and how defenses affect firm outcomes. So there are a couple of prior surveys and both sets of survey authors basically say, you know, despite, despite a lot of ink spilled in this area, we still don't know what to conclude. Now, <clears throat> since this has been known for a while, a number of people have conjectured, well, the obvious possible solution to this takeover defense puzzle is that we've got heterogeneity. heterogeneity. You know, it's, it, I think it appeals to us as economists to, to be skeptical of a one-size-fits-all type of inference about anything, including takeover defenses. So it's intuitively appealing that takeover defenses <clears throat> excuse me, are unlikely to have, uh, all takeover defenses especially, are unlikely to have the same effects on all firms at the same time, at the same time of the firm's lives. So, so this is appealing, that heterogeneity could explain this. But I'd like to say more, and I think we can begin to start to say more about this. And one place to begin in saying more about this is, so if takeover defenses, um, like most things, have cost and benefits. Thank you, Laura. We could start to uh, think through what would cause these cost and benefits to both arise and then possibly change. Um, so for example, what, do, what are the costs of takeover defenses? Well, these are the cost of agency that I think are, are part and parcel of the entrenchment hypothesis. Uh, and the notion that um, as, you, um, as you acquire more defenses, you insulate the manager more, and the cost to the organization increases. What are the, what are the benefits? Well, Again, these are the channels by which the shareholder's interest hypothesis works, and in, in particular, the bonding benefits that I discussed a moment ago. Here's a conjecture. There's evidence that ownership becomes more diffuse as firms get older. As ownership gets more diffuse, that means the managerial alpha is going down, and in a Jensen-Meckling type framework, that means higher agency costs, right? So, that would suggest that over time, the cost of having a takeover defense increases or the cost curve shifts back. Or likewise, it, there's evidence that firms rely less over time on important relationships through which these bonding benefits might arise, such as strategic partnerships and reliance on, say, a single large customer. So, so as firms age and those the importance of those specific types of business relationships decline, it's, this is an argument that maybe takeover defense benefits are, sh the, are shifting to the left as, as firms age over time, or say, as firm age, I should say. So what this suggests is that if these cost curves are increasing, the benefits are decreasing, as firms age, you would expect firms to have fewer of these takeover defenses as they age. 
However, as pointed out a moment ago, there's not a lot of movement here. There are very few removals in any given firm year. And it turns out that if you track a, uh, uh, the firm's use of E-index provisions, as shown here, from their IPO as they age, the, you see very little downward slope here. If anything, there's a slight increase in firms' use of E-index provisions from year zero through 15 years old. So there's also been some noting of this phenomenon in prior research, and, and people have sort of wrestled with this question of, well, why would takeover defenses be so sticky? And one argument suggested by John Coates, a legal scholar in this area, is that they're the result of manager, sorry, of institutional inertia, as we see this push-pull effect playing out at the firm level between largely institutional investors who would prefer, prefer fewer defenses and managers who would prefer more, leading to basically an institutional stalemate. Or there's also a problem of uh, free riding that, uh, you know, we have a, shareholders have this one over N problem where, you know, no individual shareholder is going to be able to internalize the full benefits of removing takeover defenses. Uh, so, so you have uh, sort of inadequate um, incentives to incur those costs. And this, this cost problem is accentuate, accentuated when you have heterogeneous shareholders who may have different valuations at the margin um, and different gains to be made from changes such as a change in takeover defenses. And then there may be also regulatory and anchoring and status quo bias effects going on as well. So regardless, given that there are relatively sticky uh, takeover defenses, how would that play out in our curve shifting exercise? Well, if we have cost increasing, benefits decreasing as a firm ages, but the number of defenses fixed at the level that they were when the firm was young, well, we're going to see this loss in value represented by the triangular area. And furthermore, as these, shift, as these curves shift further, as the firm ages more, we're going to see that triangular area get large and larger. This is what uh, my co-authors and I have proposed a term for this change over time. We call it the value reversal. And it's a hypothesis about value reversal. Uh, if that term doesn't, you know, it doesn't appeal, by all means, maybe there's a better term. But the notion is that we see that the, there's certainly some theoretical support for the notion that when firms are young, takeover defenses are value adding, and when they're older, takeover defenses are value decreasing. Now, the hypothesis by itself doesn't say anything more than the shape of this line, the slope of this line, as we're plotting value over firm age. But <clears throat> I've, I've illustrated it this way because I know the results, and the results line up to have a positive area and then fall into this negative quadrant as firms age. And let me show you some of those results. Um, this, again, is a bunch of small numbers, but just pulling from some work I, I had been involved in. These are cross-section regressions. So each column is a cross-section regression of a cohort of firms of similar age. And the regression is pretty much the same regression that John Brzezici metric run, uh, Babchuk, Cohen, and Farrell run when they're investigating the relation between the E index or a takeover index and firm value. Only all we've done is we've just run this regression uh, by age cohorts. And the key variable on the right-hand side is the E index. And you can see the coefficient doesn't decline quite monotonically, but it goes from positive to negative. Um, and the differences are significant. This is a result that is robust. You can, you, having hammered at this from several and come at it from several different angles, using pooled data, uh, looking at it several different ways, this is a pretty robust relation. And one way to illustrate it is just through scatter plots. Um, I, I like this because it, it shows not only the nature of, the, of, the, of this relation of the value reversal over time, but it also shows how messy the data are, suggesting that this value reversal is not 
the only thing going on. There's a lot of other stuff going on too, driving the relation between Q and a firm's takeover defenses. Um, so here, this is a uh, cross-section re uh, regression uh, for firms that are at IPO and the cohort of firms that I'm gonna show you here in the next two slides is the same cohort of, firm, cohort of firms. These are firms that are survivors for at least 10 years after their IPO. So the composition of firms is not changing. What you see is at IPO, there are a lot of dots up here up in the northeast part of the, of the graph. A lot of takeover defenses associated with high Qs. And as the firm gets a little older at year four, it turns out that the slope of the line is statistically uh, insignificant. And you're seeing a lot of these dots that were up here in the upper right-hand corner of the graph are starting to shift down. And then when you look at these same set of, the same set of firms when they're 10 years old, a lot of these dots have collapsed down here. The firms don't shift back and forth horizontally. They have the same number of defenses over time. What's changing over time is their Q values. And what's changing most are the Q values of the, of the firms that were over here to the right to begin with. And that's driving this value reversal. Now, what about the channels? So far I've conjectured some possible channels and uh, I don't know, I, I, I must have found it an appealing enough story to want to investigate uh, to begin with, but can we say more about what the channels are? Now, clearly, it can't be age per se. I say that perhaps with a wistfulness of, of hope of an old person, that maybe there are other factors and not just age per se that determine our destiny. Um, but it could be that age is proxying for other stuff. Um, and what might that other stuff be? Well, it'd be these things that cause the cost curve to shift up and the benefit curve to shift down. Can we get some proxies for those increasing costs or decreasing benefits of firms' takeover defenses? Again, there's some hint that maybe these curves are shifting over time. Here's one effort that, uh, in which I was engaged. This is uh, one of the projects with uh, Bill Johnson and Sang Ho Yi, where to try to gain some leverage on this, we, we, we tried to think through ways of uh, identifying proxy measures of the changing cost and benefits over time. And to do so, in this version of, uh, that I'm presenting, we borrow from and extend the Falkender and Wang uh, value of cash equation. Uh, now, the value of cash equation and estimate has been used now in a, a fairly robust literature on the value of cash. But as far as I know, these, uh, this was the first paper to do this kind of exercise where we're running um, a long horizon, say annual uh, rate of return, abnormal rate of return as the left-hand side variable. And on the right-hand side variable, we have as the key thing, a measure of the change in cash holdings divided by the firm's market cap. And the key variable that Fulkender and Wang were interested in and much of the value of cash literature has focused on since has been gamma one. And this gamma one estimate is, is interpreted as a measure of the marginal value of an extra dollar's worth of cash in the firm. And a, a, a consensus that emerges out of this part of the literature is that on average, this number is less than one, indicating that a, on average, an extra dollar's value of cash is worth less than a dollar to the firm. And this has been interpreted as an indication of agency problems at the, at the firm. So cash-rich firms also have opportunities for cash to be poorly allocated by self-interested managers. So what we do is we, ex we run this re regression with a couple of extensions. So the first thing we do is we add some variables. These are two more variables that we conjecture uh, well, draw from the literature uh, as being indications or things that are associated, are associated with agency costs. So diversifying acquisitions, having a combined CEO chair provision. So we add the diversifying acquisitions and the changes in firm CEO chair position over time 
to estimate in the same framework the value of these things to the firm. And then we also add three measures that are plausibly associated with benefits of having takeover defenses, such as the, the having large customer sales. Uh, and again, the literature suggests that having an important business relationship like, like having one particularly large customer on, on which the firm lies, relies, I should say, that, that that's, that's why you would have some bonding benefits from a takeover defense uh, in the first place. So I just want to point out that all these other variables in this cash equation are control variables um, that are also widely used. And at the risk of showing you some small numbers, I want to highlight just a couple of things. So this shows the results for cash. And like the rest of the literature, when we put everybody together, you get a number that's less than one, and significantly less than one. And again, the inference from that is that on average, an extra dollar's worth of cash for a firm, for a seasoned firm, is worth less than a dollar. Again, interpreted as an agency cost problem. Um, what we're finding is that this coefficient is relatively high for young firms and declines and gets smaller for older firms, suggesting that this agency problem is increasing as the firms age. You find similar results for these other proxy measures. Sometimes the results are not terribly clean, um, uh, but uh, to illustrate one of the potential benefits from having takeover defenses, here we see that the value of large customers to the firm, or sales to large customers to the firm, are relatively high for young firms and decline and are low for older firms, suggesting again that an extra dollar value of sales to a large customer with whom presumably the firm has quasi rents at stake and at risk of holdup problems, and then that can be bonded or guaranteed with the takeover defense, that that is relatively important for younger firms and less important for older firms. So seeing this um, uh, for each of these uh, different proxies of cost or benefits, is consistent with the notion that these cost curves and benefit curves are in fact shifting to the left as firms age. Again, a lot of small numbers on this graph, but I want to point out that the next step in the analysis would be to see, see whether these particular proxies for decreasing benefits or increasing cost interact with having takeover defenses to contribute to the value reversal, to contribute to lower Qs. That's what this set of numbers is designed to illustrate. And again, I'll just highlight. So if you look at uh, this, this uh, term here, which is on the left, sorry, on the right-hand side, and where on the right-hand side we have Tobin's Q's measures, what the, what the interpretation here of a negative coefficient is that the effect of having a lot of takeover defenses on Q is particularly important when the value of cash is low. Meaning that that channel seems to be at work. And you see the same thing for each one of these other measures of changing cost or, or benefits. I won't go through each of them, um, but want to use this to illustrate that at least this is preliminary evidence that not only are these benefits and cost of takeover defenses changing, getting smaller, or moving to the left, I should say, over time, but this is preliminary evidence that those shifts are, in fact, contributing to this value reversal that we see. Now, something I think is also worth pointing out is that the primary right-hand side variable in these tests of whether or not uh, aging interacts with having a lot of takeover defenses in a way that contributes to low firm value, those are still all significant. Those effects don't go away. And I think that's really important to point out because it means that each of these individual proxies for a change in cost and a change in benefit is picking up only a small part of the picture. There are other cost and benefits that are associated with firm age that are not being identified in these individual channels that, are, that we've been able to identify. There are a lot of other con con contributors, I should say, to, uh, to the cost and benefits of having a takeover defense. So what do, what do infer? What do take from all this? Well, I think the, no, no, the not one size fits all uh, in, 
intuition definitely fits there. But we can do a lot more than that. Um, we can start to identify patterns. This pattern associated with firm age, I think, is pretty darn robust. And begin to identify channels by which these changes in cost and benefits are occurring. Let me talk a little bit about um, the, the next question. So the next question is, how about dynamics? Takeover defenses are not frequently changed, but they sometimes are. Now, whereas there have been literally dozens and dozens of papers written on this question of the takeover defense puzzle, trying to examine whether defenses add or destroy value, there's almost nothing written on the dynamics by which firms choose to add or remove takeover defenses. And, and I'm interested particularly in removals. <clears throat> so I'd like to, uh, by, by again flashing a bunch of small numbers at you, I, I'd want to just highlight some preliminary attempts to move the ball on this question a little bit, because I think this is something that, uh, that this is an area that is open to um, a lot of low hanging fruit still. And in this regression, the left-hand side variable is, or set of regressions, the left-hand side variable is a, a binary uh, a dependent variable that takes on a value of one if in a given firm year, the firm removes a pre-existing takeover defense. And on the right-hand side are the various measures of benefits and cost of having a defense. And the notion that we're starting with here is simply the notion that Okay, when would a firm remove a defense? Well, it's when the defense is going to be really costly and the cost of doing the removal is relatively low. So this is picking up and trying to examine the first part of that statement. So are defenses removed when the defenses get really costly or the benefits are, of having the defense are dropping? And without getting into the details of these, of these specific uh, coefficient estimates, Basically, what this is showing is that when the cost of having defenses are relatively high or the benefits of having these defenses are growing lower and lower, smaller and smaller, that's when we are more likely to see removals. And that's what this last item says. Again, more small stuff, but the takeaway here that I'd like to point to is to illustrate that, well, the, okay, on the one hand, you'd expect to see removals happen when these defenses are getting really costly. You'd also expect to see them when the actual mechanical process of removing the defense is of low cost. So do we have measures of cost of doing the removal? And here, this is more of a stretch, but we're conjecturing that there are a couple of different ways that you might proxy for the cost of removing the defense. For example, if there are things that lower the cost of shareholders acting collectively and enabling shareholders to get together and act cohesively, then those things would increase the likelihood of a removal. Or if there are things that decrease the heterogeneity of the information environment, allowing shareholders to be more likely to come to consensus on a move such as a takeover defense removal, you would be more likely to see such a removal. So that's what these variables are trying to catch. And as just to illustrate uh, one sort of uh, almost in your face obvious example, one of the indicators for a decrease in the cost of collection, collective action is when the Harvard Shareholder Rights Project targeted a firm. So what the Harvard uh, Project did was it had a bunch of law school students solve or partly solve the collective action problem for shareholders by saying, okay, we're going to act on behalf of shareholders and do the communications and apply the pressure to our target firm's managers, thereby lowering the cost of other shareholders to sort of follow along in their wake and vote for the removal of a classified board. So that's, a, that's sort of a, 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 a maybe a, an easy way to think of and interpret these variables that are trying to pick up the uh, decreases in the cost of collective action. The takeaway here is that the likelihood of a, uh, of a removal appears to not only increase 
with the cost of having the defense, but it also increases with a decrease in the cost of removing the defense. Question number five. This is the last question. Um, and then I have a couple propositions for you. Can takeover defenses be used for empirical identification? Well, I think the answer that we would like to have, at least many of us, I, again, here, I think here now is literally hundreds of researchers, we would like that answer to be yes, because of all of the tests in which we and others have had takeover defenses on the right-hand side of various models, empirical models, where we're trying to explain some left-hand side variable. So we'd like that answer to this question to be yes. Uh, one framework that has attracted particular attention is the use of state anti-takeover laws to identify tests. And here, the identification is very appealing because a takeover law plausibly can be viewed as exogenous for most of the firms that are covered by the law. And um, now the count is about 100 papers have used this strategy dating back, I think, to the first paper by Garvey and Hanka, or Hanka, I should say, in 1999. Here's the construct. You may have seen this before, but um, here's the, the empirical construct that researchers have in mind when using a state takeover law to identify a test. So the idea here is illustrated using a hypothetical firm in Massachusetts that adopted a business combination law in 1989. And what researchers have done is they've compared some firm characteristic from before 1989 or before this date to after this date. And they associate changes in that characteristic to a presumed increase in takeover protection for a covered firm. So for example, uh, Bertrand and Malanathan do this experiment, and they look at characteristics such as new plant investment, new employee hires. Um, and they see that investment goes down in the post period, and they say, ah, this must be due to the search for a quiet life on the part of managers. Well, there are problems to be incorporated in this. So one problem is a lot of tests in this space want to use data from before 1982, but it turns out that before 1982, if you remember, we had this prior wave of offensive and defensive innovations. One of the defensive innovations were these very strict first generation state anti-takeover laws. If you read what, these, what the provisions of these laws and what these laws did, Man, these were really strong anti-takeover. There's, there's, it's not only a coincidence that when you look at takeover waves, there was a lull in the 1970s. Um, these laws, among other things, gave state-appointed uh, uh, politicians the authority to intervene in a takeover bid for a domestically uh, 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 incorporated firm. And uh, they even, in some cases, had criminal penalties for outside bidders, if the bidders did not follow a certain procedure in a certain way in their takeover bids. So it was a really costly uh, to try to navigate the, the, the rules of these laws and the takeover protection was huge. And you can begin to see the problem in this sort of test that well, now we're doing a before and after comparison. It's not clear where the takeover protection was higher before or after the business combination law was passed. And this problem gets exacerbated when you start to think about other state takeover laws that were adopted after 1982 and other previously adopted firm level defenses. So as drawn here for a, a Massachusetts firm, Massachusetts firms were also previously covered by another type of state takeover law, control share acquisition law. And then the particular firm that is illustrated here also had a supermajority vote requirement which the evidence that I haven't really pointed to yet uh, if it, it, it indicates serves as a good substitute for these state laws. So if that's the case, now you've got a situation where you're doing the before versus after comparison. And if anything, you know, when you see investment go down over here in this post-1989 period, you might infer the opposite, that, huh, investment was going down, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, managers preferred more investment when they were 
subject to a lot of, or had a lot of takeover protections, not when they uh, were free from such protections. Um, so that's one problem. There are a number of other challenges to this identification strategy. So um, uh, in a recent paper, Baker shows that uh, if you not only control for these legal environment in which these laws are passed, but you also just get the diff and diff test run more, uh, more accurately or using up to, up to uh, date techniques, then even more results that previously were established in the literature go away. Um, and Samaman has a paper that shows that clustering standard errors by state of incorporation, another widespread practice in this, in this area, leads to biased standard errors that cause us to over-reject the null. And in, in our applications, this is particularly a problem because of unequal size in our clusters. And you know, when you have Delaware included, Delaware is such a huge cluster that it really makes this problem unusually uh, big in our application. And then you get a problem down here. Uh, legal scholars have for over a decade been arguing that those of us in finance have been getting this takeover defense literature wrong from the get-go. So I've actually seen in person, uh, you know, these are, these are people I highly respect and learn from, but I've actually seen in person legal scholars say things such as, these finance guys are clueless. I think that's a direct quote. And what, is, what are we clueless about? Well, we're clueless about the notion, of the, 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 the uh, fact that all firms effectively have a shadow poison pill available at any time, that any firm can adopt a poison pill. And furthermore, through a series of precedents, precedents primarily in Delaware courts, you can adopt a poison pill even in the middle of a takeover battle which means this is something that you can pull off the shelf virtually any time. And most, most firms have in place the technical details that they need to adopt the poison pill, such as the authorization to issue a new share or a new class of shares, which is important for adopting a pill. So as a result, the argument is that by this view, which I call the extreme view of shadow poison pills, Pills can be adopted costlessly at any time. The protection offered by a pill trumps the protection that anything else conceivably could offer in a, in a defensive sense. And thereby, all the defenses that firms have are irrelevant, or any takeover protection that a state might offer through a law is irrelevant. Now again, I call this the extreme view of shadow poison pills. I think it has, uh, a, it has crept into our field. I've, sat in the audience where I've seen discussants criticize a paper by basically citing the extreme view of shadow poison pills and saying, you know, these tests, these tests don't mean a lot because these take our defense on the right hand side doesn't mean much because everybody has a shadow poison pill. So, so that, that does and has had influence on how uh, the finance profession is thinking about takeover defenses. I think it's important both to acknowledge that argument but also to acknowledge that the argument should not be bought. Uh, what hook, line, and sinker? I think is the colloquialism. That there are there is a real pushback on on this point of view, and I've summarized here just only a subset of the uh, pushback, both theoretical and empirical, that I think is important to consider. You know, for example, if all these defenses are so meaningless, why do managers care about them? Why do they keep on adapting them? Why do they spend time on this? Why do investors care about them? Why do legislators care about them and adopt, continue to adopt anti-taker laws uh, during the period that pills are supposed to have been widely available to all firms? There's a lot of empirical correlations out there between various firm outcomes and various measures of firms takeover defenses. Can they all be spurious? And again, literally the argument is that, these, that, that the vast majority, if not all, of the empirical correlations that we see in our literature are spurious. Um, can they all be spurious? I mean, that would take a very, very strongly held prior to discount the results of dozens, well up in the hundreds of empirical results. 
there's evidence. I've been involved in some of this, and I, I should probably have given more credit to other authors in this space. Um, to you know that other provisions, other provisions do in fact deter takeover. So despite the premise of the extreme view of shadow poison pills, there's evidence that's directly contradictory to it. Um, there are also theoretical gaps. I, I won't go into this much, but basically, just even following the court law precedent, uh, there isn't even today consensus among legal scholars that poison pills are as ironclad as assumed in the extreme view of shadow poison pill point of view. And if, sh if poison pills are not as ironclad as assumed, then that itself leaves open the door for incremental takeover protection afforded by other defenses. Related to this question is, do takeover defenses and takeover defense indices work to measure takeover defense? Well, I think this is another area that is still begging for more uh, insight and, and sort of some consolidation of, of knowledge. But here's some preliminary evidence that it turns out that the G index, the E index, and the O index, which uh, I think Straska and Waller characterized as all the provisions that are in the G index but not in the E index, it turns out that each of these indices is negatively related to takeover likelihood, but there's an important caveat. In tests that do not control for endogeneity, a number of authors in this literature do not find a correlation. It's only when you take into account the endogenous nature of, thank you, it's time to stop. <laughs> thank you, that, that you see this negative correlation which is sort of good news and bad news. It means that, yes, we can use these things, but probably um, uh, we need to take into account the endogeneity before we just stick these indices on the right-hand side. Because of time, I need to um, begin to wrap up. I would like to take a couple more minutes. I want to simply wave my hands at this graph, which is a Venn diagram that shows that, at least preliminary evidence shows that there are some provisions that empirically are negatively related to takeover likelihood. And there are some indices, such as the E index, that are negatively related to takeover likelihood only to the extent that they include some of the provisions that are in the yellow circle. There are other indices that people have used, and they too are correlated with takeover deterrence to the extent that they have some of these provisions that empirically are related. So we can begin to narrow down on the provisions that empirically provide some deterrence. Okay, I promised that I would, um, I'm gonna skip off of this conclusion slide, which says basically, yes, under certain provisions and certain uh, care uh, in your empirical uh, techniques, that uh, you can use takeover defenses for empirical identification. And I wanna get to the papers that I think uh, are important in this area. These are the papers I think are gonna have a big impact on our field. Each of these is a data paper. Um, <clears throat> so the first three papers basically point out that there are a lot of errors in the data that many of us have been using. The ISS data, for example, have very large errors. The last paper points out something that um, uh, others have also, you know, paper by Laura Field and Michelle Lowry also nudge in this direction, which is the point that uh, there's a big difference in the use of takeover defenses between the set of firms that are in our databases and firms that are not in our takeover defense databases. Those two sets of insights are gonna be really important. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here's just a list of firm, fractions of firms that have takeover defenses in the E-index using the information available through words on, uh, from ISS. Here's the information from uh, update of that data by paper by Karthus, von Meyerneck, and Schmidt. Now, I don't anticipate that you could read any of those numbers, but here's a graph that shows you, with colored highlights the size of the discrepancy between the data we've been using 
and the data as they have collected through their hand counts. The yellow bar, the yellow areas are discrepancies in the neighborhood of two and five percentage points. The blue bars are five and 10 percentage points and the red bars are discrepancies of over 25 percentage points in the counts of firms that have these provisions. So that raises really big questions. Um, <clears throat> the first is when and where do these data errors matter? I think there's going to be a whole scale sort of reevaluation of many things that we think we know about takeover defenses, including a lot of what I just discussed in light of better data. To the extent that life cycle effects are, are real, uh, what are the specific drivers on the cost and benefit side? <clears throat> and then another interesting takeover takeaway is that can we simply use firm age as a proxy for the heterogeneity? heterogeneity of a firm's defenses and the defenses effects on our various outcome variables. So I envision just having firm age on more and more right-hand sides of empirical tests. Oops. What other things are subject to life cycle effects? And what other life cycle effects, for example, the secular decline in Q as firms age, how much is that driven by the value reversal? In preliminary tests, I think the answer is quite a bit. A lot of what we see as firms age seem to be correlated with the detrimental effect that having old defenses have on firms' current outcomes. <clears throat> How about individual take takeover defenses? Do they interact in ways that can provide some, some insight? Are some substitutes for others? Are some just not? take our defenses at all and should be excluded from our empirical work? <clears throat> and can we recognize or reconcile, I should say, the extreme view of shadow poison pills with the data and come up hopefully with some sort of um, um, moderated understanding of the role of shadow pills? What are the consequences for the people who are involved in adopting directors? Do we see heterogeneous effects for instances where defenses are adding value versus de destroying value? And then finally, what new innovations are we seeing at work right now? There's a paper, as just one example, there's a paper by uh, Souther and, and uh, poor guy, Surfling, <laughs> um, where they, they show that you know, ESG language and involvement among top managers seems to cover up poor performance, or at least that's their interpretation. Now, to the extent that there are other papers that have that sort of point in the same direction, this is, suggests that one side effect, in some cases possibly maybe even a motive for uh, going for a different or broader statements of corporate purpose are actually playing a role as a new defensive innovation in the takeover market. One of many ideas. I think this is a really ripe area, um, and I hope that these slides capture some of the enthusiasm that I, I genuinely have for this area, but also the opportunities that work in this area have for, for research. Uh, again, to some extent, this is like old-style corporate governance and corporate finance, and in that sense, it deals with some of the big issues of our field. Thank you. Thanks for your patience.